I will create advertising where we will find a way to say the name Aflac over and over and over again. What they had was not the it factor, you know, I'm rich, I'm talented, I'm brilliant. They had what we call the grit factor. There are a thousand ants with germs crawling up your hand, all the way up your neck and into your mouth and nose. And if you keep that in mind, you will not shake hands with people again. I don't care if you show me a drunk guy dancing on a roof, I'll buy it. Hello, Linda. Hello, Gennady. It's a pleasure uh, uh, to see you, and thank you very much for taking time to talk to me. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll introduce you briefly to my viewers, and uh, I will tell um, in order of things which I was impressed about you. Let me start with a quote from someone uh, who said that you are the most powerful lady on Madison Avenue. <laughs> and I thought, what? Yeah, that, that must have been my mother, but, but anyway, well, that sounds, sounds good, very nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Linda is the CEO, founder, uh, and the president uh, of uh, Linda Kaplan Thaler Production. Uh, it's an advertising agency which were uh, growing like a rocket from five employee and small office into 800 employee and it's one of the major advertising agencies in the United States. And Linda is known for her creativity and the fact that sometimes three words can make you famous. <laughs> and uh, in my part of the world, uh, when I mentioned that, yes, 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 uh, uh, people say, oh, yes. We, we... You're, not, you're not saying it with enough. Oh, tell me, how, how should I do that? Yes, 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 <laughs> except in China. In China, the woman does not go, ah, ah, ah. The woman goes, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> We had to tone it down for that market. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how funny. But then, and, and then I like the um, explanation, sort of truly or so organic experience or something. And the, you were um, helping to advertise the shampoo, not some sexual products. And that was amazing because it's stuck into people's mind as really very creative. Another thing which you've done, and I loved it, when uh, we're talking about, you know, high flyers, corporate world, and, you know, insurances, agencies, and you came up with such a silly idea of advertising a large insurance company with a duck. <laughs> yes. Duck. Yeah, you know, uh, up until that time in the insurance category, all the advertising was very serious. And this company had, Aflac was, only had like 3% awareness and their advertising was like everybody else's, right? And what I realized was Aflac is what we call uh, an acronym, right? It stands for American uh, Family Life Assurance Company. Well, n nobody can remember the name, so there's no point doing advertising if they don't remember who it is, right? So uh, I said to the CEO of Aflac, I said, I will create advertising where we will find a way to say the name Aflac over and over and over again. And he said, if you do that, I don't care if you show me a drunk guy dancing on a roof, I'll buy it. And uh, when I gave it out to people to work on, at my agency, nobody could remember the name, right? And I kept saying, Aflac, Aflac. Aflac. And one of our art directors said, say that again. And he pinched my nose. We're a very informal company, so you can pinch the nose of the CEO. And I went, Aflac. He said, you know, you sound like a duck quacking. Now, I don't know how a duck quacks in Russian, but in the United quack, States... Quack, quack. Oh, quack, kriya, kriya, kriya. It's slightly different. Kriya. Because, you know, I, I left Russia about 30 years ago, but of course, Russia... <laughs> And so I said that he was just kidding around. I said, no, that's how we're going to get the United States and Japan. They're very big in Japan to remember the name Aflac, this silly duck that nobody hears. Um, and will. And anyway, it's gone on for over 20 years now. And uh, the duck made a lot of money. <laughs> and, and Aflac, 
became a multi-billion dollar company and uh, they're very kind and I like them. I love them so much. They're, they're a family owned company and we're happy. But now, no, no, the most important thing and that I'm most proud of, not that the Aflac uh, case became a Harvard study, not that it tripled and quadrupled their sales. You know what makes me really emotional? Oh, tell me. <laughs> oh, Gennady. Affleck is so well known that when ducks see other ducks, they immediately think of supplemental insurance. Uh huh. <laughs> I, I yeah, I think I missed that. But um, uh, I was looking at your kind of um, acting, and they, I missed. Oh, that. okay. No, I was saying that it's Affleck is so well known right. that when a duck sees another duck, uh -huh. he immediately thinks of supplemental insurance. So okay. that's, well, that's, that's oh gosh, it's even deeper than that. So there is some yeah, right. Yeah, so oh, interesting. So that's what I call creativity. That's what I call creativity. And of course, another thing which you've done and shook the nation with this uh, Toy R Us. I do not want to grow up uh, jingle. Uh, Do they have that in Ukraine and Russia? No, uh, I think Toy R Us are coming. I think there are in, uh, I think in Russia for sure. Uh, there are in former USSR countries. I'm not sure about Ukraine. I don't think that they are still in Ukraine. So. Well, I was. I wrote that several years ago, and um, the 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 challenge was Toys R Us. You know, if you bought a toy at Toys R Us, you could buy it any place. You know, other toy stores. So there had to be a bigger reason why to go to Toys R Us. And so what became important to us was not so much what you buy, but how you feel when you buy it. Exactly. And so this notion of, uh, I, I don't want to grow up, I'm a Toys R Us kid, right? That adults don't want to grow up and kids don't want to grow up. And so I said, we've got to make that into a song that kids will sing. And I basically wrote a jingle uh, you have jingles, jingles yes. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that had all the copy points, that they were the biggest toy store, that they were the cheapest. And so I wrote it. Uh, I actually wrote it on a toy piano because I wanted to think like a little child. Right. Mm -hmm. And I started writing, I don't want to grow up on the Toys R Us kids. Mm -hmm. There's a million toys at Toys R Us. You know, and I wrote it. You can sing. And then I did, wonderful. So you can even and then I didn't play it for anybody except my art director because I thought it was terrible. And he insisted that I play it for my boss, um, who is James Patterson, now the number one selling mystery writer in the world. Look. Yes. I'm going yes. to talk about that because you mentioned in one of his uh, uh, novels, Noonles or something like, uh, yes, it's like spy novel and, and uh, someone wants yeah, to do jobs. Nooners, I know, yeah. And I, I, they, they talk about my company, but I'm not the murderer, so I'm going to give yeah, it away. But I, I, like no, him. I know him. I've read quite a lot of books. Yeah, and, I, uh, and he said, yeah, let's give it a try. And we tested it with a lot of other songs. And lo and behold, I wrote it. I mean, I was thrilled because I was a music teacher before I went into advertising. Um, and Bill Clinton as you picked up the book, I did his uh, emotional advertising when uh, in, in the 92 election. Um, he asked me to do advertising for him because I had done very emotional ads for, among other companies, uh, Kodak Film. And um, he, really, he really understood and understands the value of marketing. So to have him and Jim, and they're writing another book together, is oh, just really? really thrilling for me, yeah. yeah. But By the way, I will, I will, I do want to mention one thing that Jim uses the names of people he knows in his books mm -hmm. and Linda Kaplan, my name is Linda Kaplan Thaler, but my original name is Linda Kaplan, has been in many of his books. Mm -hmm. In one book, I am a serial killer. In another book, I play a judge. So every once in a while I read a book and I have my, I see my name on there. It's very funny. So. Yes, indeed. And of course, you were helping Hillary Clinton as well in her political yes. campaign. For the yes, in 2008, I worked on her campaign as well. And, uh, and for Bill Bradley in 2000, I enjoy political advertising. Uh, you know, the great thing about writing political advertising, uh, not in the case of the candidates I work with, because I only tell the truth, but by law, you can say anything you want in when you do political advertising because of your freedom, your, the freedom of speech, right? But you can't do that when you're advertising a product. So if I'm advertising a loaf of bread, I need to have more 
research and um, uh, uh, graphic discussions and, and viewpoints before I can say that this bread is better than that bread. Oh, but I don't have to do law. that. Is it by law? But it's by law. It's a, it's a law by the, yeah, by the FCC in the United States. So it's really odd because with advertising for you know, political candidates, you can basically just make stuff up. So mm. there you go. Uh, yeah, I don't want to go to politics, especially American politics. I mean, I don't know much about, but uh, yeah. But I, I, I still I feel good that you didn't work for, I mean, yeah, but Donald Trump. But it's okay. I, I don't want to uh, <laughs> bring politics because I have mixed feelings about it. Uh, but yeah. uh, it's absolutely fantastic. And I'm really kind of, I feel... Uh, um, honored that you are talking to me now. So, oh, I feel honored to speak to you. You are an amazingly accomplished man. Amazingly. Oh, thank so, you. thank you for reaching out to me. But the one thing which really drew my attention to you and uh, made me really feel, um, uh, really wanted to have an interview with you is uh, are your books. And your books, I love them. I mean, you co authored several books. I haven't read Bang how to make yourself heard in the noisy world, in the modern, something like that. But I've read Power of Nice, Power of Kind, and I've read, of course, Great to Great. And I think in the, uh, that you write in such easiness and uh, with the humor, with the examples, and you're talking very lightly about really serious things. And that's what I think makes your book very attractive and the way of the selling lists. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that. And I would like to talk, if you, you don't mind, about your latest one, and that is Greed to Great. Because I think that the book is incredibly relevant to the current situation and can help people as well as it helped me. So do you mind to say something about, you know, why you've written that and the major maybe concepts uh, in the book? Yes, and thank you for, for mentioning the, the, the book because it was, uh, I wish that I had written the book many years earlier because I would have possibly um, really worked at working with people in a different kind of way. I try to do it with kindness. But what was so amazing, Robin Koval, who was my co-author co and ran the company with me, we always try to write books that are counterintuitive, right? We, we wrote The Power of Nice and nobody was writing marketing books about being nice. It was, the word nice was not even mentioned anywhere. It was always like swim with the sharks. And it was all this, you know, you got to eat your young in order to survive. And we found that the most successful leaders, by and large, were actually very nice, kind people. And so they attracted people who wanted to work for them, right? That's what we did. We tried to do in our company. And we were looking for the counterintuitive message in grit because everybody knows you need to work hard to succeed. But what they didn't know is that it is the most important element to somebody's success, right? It's not having a high IQ. It's not um, being born with incredibly virtuoso talents. In fact, the most successful people in the world are not geniuses the percentage of people who are born geniuses that become successful is only 2%. Mm -hmm. It's actually inversely related. And the reason a lot of researchers believe that is true is because people who are complete geniuses, everything is very easy for them. Their school, their grade, everything is easy. So they're not equipped to handle a challenge. And so later in life, when they want to start a business or you know, start a new career, they hit a roadblock and they go, they don't know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Conversely, people who have more average IQs, and that this makes me feel especially wonderful, <laughs> me too. not being a genius, um, have challenges when they grow up. They're not the smartest kid in the class. Um, as a matter of fact, people who have had extreme challenges there is a tendency for them to become more successful because they know how to fight, right? In the United States, there is a lawyer who is considered absolutely brilliant because he has committed to memory. He's a trial attorney. He's committed to memory every single U.S. case on the law books, 
We're talking about thousands and thousands of cases. And what he said was, I'm not a born genius. I was born dyslexic. Right? Is that the word you... Yes, so well, I know yeah, that dyslexic. Richard Branson was, and, and, and there were quite a number of people, actually. A no, number of people. And he said, I realized when I went to law school that I would not be able to read a case study in the courtroom fast enough. So I decided to memorize them all. So you see that's another, and there's so many examples of this. Um, uh, Jack Ma, right? When he got out of college, he couldn't even get a job working in a fast food restaurant. The famous Michael Jordan, we think of him as so talented and gifted. No, when he was in high school, he couldn't qualify for his high school varsity basketball team. And he was going to give up. And his mother said, no, you're going to go out every day. You're going to, after your schoolwork, you're going to practice for hours and hours and hours, and you'll make the team. Well, he did a lot more than make the team, right? Mm -hmm. Colin Powell, are you familiar with Colin Powell? Yes, the general, the black general in, in the US. Yeah, a friend of mine, and I'm on, on one of his uh, committees at a college we both attended, a public college. Um, he was a C minus student in college, and then he discovered that there was the ROTC, I'm not sure what it's called in your country, but it was a military club. And he realized that his real passion was to serve the country, to make the country safer. And from then on, he became an A student because he knew that was the only way he was gonna be able to rise up in the ranks. All of these people had moderately average IQs, were not born with any specific gifts or talents. What they had was not the it factor, you know, I'm rich, I'm talented, I'm brilliant. They had what we call the grit factor. Right. And we believe grit is made up of four components, just like the letters of the, of the word. Guts, the ability to get out there and do it. Resilience, every time you're knocked down or your boss says, no, do it better, go back, your ability to get up. Initiative, your creative juices, finding ways to solve problems. And T, tenacity, hold on to what you believe in and keep working at it. So the research is there and it's, it's wonderful when I speak about it because I speak at different companies but many, many universities around the world. And I go, you know what? You don't have to go to an Ivy League or a top rated in a university to become successful. In uh, the United States, um, when you look at the top 100 companies, Almost none of those CEOs went to famous schools or Ivy League schools. How oh, interesting! Mm. Yes, it's uh, it's it's like for me, you know, when I hear about that, uh, I, I didn't have it easy. My 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 parents are, you know, the way in academia, and but uh, you know, I was born in Kazakhstan, you know, in Almaty, so it's like, and I managed to to become what I am, which I feel that you know one tenth of my potential, that's what I feel that everybody feels probably that. But um, I, I feel that, you know, about my children, because I have, um, you know, grown up children and I have two small girls. Uh, actually, they insisted on being here. They said, no, out. <laughs> yeah. But then I'll say hello to them later then. Okay. Yeah. But um, uh, uh, they have everything they can think of. You know, they are, you know, Dari is eight and Alexandra is going to be seven. And do I have to create artificially some hardships for them, you know, in order to build their characters? Or I just, uh, you know, unconditional love and everything, that's what I'm giving. So, you know what I mean? So it's like how to make a challenge not to break them. Because there is another uh, possibility that you put too much pressure on your child. Right. And just gives up and, you know, yeah. so you carry on, uh, you will give up. You know... Uh, 20, 20 years ago uh, in the United States and some other countries, a psychologist did a study and he said, our children do not feel special enough. We need to tell them that just by being who they are, they are brilliant, they are unique, they're steadfast. This was called the self... So sorry. I'm so sorry. I have to turn that off because it's going to keep... Um, I don't hear anything, everything is fine, so. 
you didn't see that thing go down, it's gonna keep coming. If you don't hear it, that's okay. All right. That's I don't okay. hear, I don't see it, uh, just, it's okay. You don't, you didn't hear a be, uh, something go off, like a bell? No. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, this was called the self-esteem movement. Mm -hmm. And it's probably the worst advice ever to give parents and children. Is it so? Oh. Yeah, and so children are told, you know, we're told you're great. They even stopped giving medals out in races in schools. They said, everybody's a winner, right? Um, and there was one medal for one scholastic event. 200 people were running. 200 people got a little gold cup that said, if you've had fun, you've won. I'm not sure what career they were preparing them for, mm -hmm. but it wasn't yours and it certainly wasn't mine. And we did a great injustice to our, injustice to our children mm -hmm. by telling them, you're just great the way you are. And the, a lot of millennials come to the workforce expecting, wow, I was on time every single day. I deserve a bonus. And what I tell them is, you were on time every single day and you did a good job. And you may call it a bonus. I'm calling it your salary. And you will continue to get that salary as long as you are on time and do the work. And so we've done a great injustice to our kid. You know, we interviewed an amazing teacher uh, from Iceland. And she teaches kindergarten students. Mm -hmm. And she felt that the students didn't have enough grit, tenacity. So she said she had just an exercise with her little five-year-olds. And she says, you can pick all these different activities, but you have to do it for at least a half hour. And you have to finish what you start. So a few little boys said they wanted to learn how to knit. <laughs> she said, good, but you will need to do it for a half hour. And they said, okay, well, knitting for five-year-old boys is very difficult. <laughs> it's difficult for you and me, right? And they're knitting and they're knitting and they start to cry. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. It's very boring. And she says, when you grow up, a lot of things are going to be very boring. So we want you to learn now. And they made them go through the whole half hour. And at the end, the whole class applauded because they finished a row of stitches. And she said, this is the best thing we need to te teach our kids. Also, we don't let our children get bored, right? We constantly are trying to amuse them or look at your phone or do something else. And you know what? That's terrible. Because kids are their most creative when they're bored. We, we, we cannot keep, you know, scheduling all these things in their lives when they, you know, we feel like they're, oh, they're not doing anything for five minutes. Their brains will come up with ideas. Einstein said when he worked in the patent office, the only job a Jewish man could have at the time, and he was so brilliant and so, uh, had so many ideas. No, he had to work in the patent office. And he said, I'm really happy I had that job because I was so bored. I would sit back in my chair, back and forth, and just think of things. And one day I was thinking, what happens when a ball drops on a trampoline? It goes up. And, and he said, started making me think about gravity. And he said, the theory of relativity came about because I was so bored in the patent office that my mind started to do all these amazing things. And he said, he's the first one to say he was not a genius. Matter of fact, when he was in kindergarten, they thought he was slow. Yes. Mm -hmm. But what, what he said is, my accomplishments have to do with only one thing, my tenacity, and I am the most curious person ever. It was my curiosity. Same thing with Da Vinci, always talked about his uh, curiosity in his uh, writings, in his autobiography. Uh, so I think that we take these things for granted and we're so busy on our phones and we're virtually someplace else when we're with other people, we're not really with them. Uh, Microsoft did a study and found, because it's so hard for us to concentrate, right? We're always looking at the next thing. And this information, when it hits us, data, uh, it hits the dopamine center of our brain, which is where addiction is. So 
we not only have people suffering from drug addiction, alcohol addiction, gambling addiction, but now data ad addiction. And it's very, very hard to stop that. Um, and we have to train ourselves to be thinking and, you know, put the, put the phone in another room. You know, when you're driving, lock it up someplace. Uh, you're absolutely right. And in fact, the same reaction, if you deprive a child or an adult from this, uh, you know, gadget, then you get hysteria, then you get aggression. So, but look, friend of mine sent me this. It's an imitation of a mobile phone and it's a wooden thing. So he and said, he now use this. Yeah, use this. Don't take your mobile phone with, with, with you. Use this. That is it's much more creative. That is brilliant because it's that tactile sensation that Absolutely. we're craving, right? Absolutely. You know, it's also a question of, People say that they can't become successful because they're not, um, they don't have enough uh, willpower. Willpower is not what enables people to do great things. As a matter of fact, willpower doesn't last. Uh, there's been studies done that by four o'clock in the afternoon, if you've told yourself, I'm not gonna have that cigarette, I'm not gonna, it, it doesn't work. What you need to do is reframe the thing that you are addicted to. For example, somebody wants to lose weight and they're sitting in a restaurant and they see across the aisle, somebody's eating a delicious piece of chocolate cake, right? <laughs> and you want this chocolate cake, but you're telling yourself, I can't, I wanna lose weight, I can't. You're doing it the wrong way. What I always tell people when I give my speeches is, close your eyes, so not close your eyes, right? Now I want you to think about that delicious chocolate cake. You thinking about it? Yes. Now I want you to think of a cockroach jumping in to the icing on the cake yeah. and the cockroach inviting all his aunts and uncles and cousins, thousands of them, to partake in this delicious dessert that they're having. Okay, now open your eyes. Will you ever have another piece of chocolate cake, right? No, 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 no. Right? Excellent. And so what I tell people, you know, in, with the coronavirus, um, if we, if we, uh, take these habits of not shaking hands and not putting our hand to our face, we take these and apply it to everything, you know, so you don't get the flu or you don't get a cold and you don't catch pneumonia. I think what we're going to find is that people are not going to get a lot of these other illnesses. So what I've been thinking is when you shake somebody's hand now, think, close your eyes, imagine that this person's hand has a thousand germs there are a thousand ants with germs crawling up your hand all the way up your neck and into your mouth and nose. And if you keep that in mind, you will not shake hands with people again. So it's all about reframing things in order to accomplish that we want. We also talk about in the book about that the most successful people are not my way or the highway or sturdy like an oak tree. The most successful people are the ones that are the most adaptable. And we, we have a chapter we called Ben Like Bamboo. Yeah, I, I was in, yeah, I was, I was speaking in Japan a few years ago and I went to the bamboo forest and they, that is the strongest plant in the world. No matter what the elements are, it doesn't break. It has strong roots and it has an empty hollow piece inside. So mm -hmm. nothing can break, it just bends. And I think what an amazing metaphor for the world that we're in now, right? We have to adapt. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And um, yes, and, and this is, it's, it comes from neurolinguistical programming, I think this, um, you know, uh, chocolate cake with the, with the cockroaches, it's, it, I think it's great. So, because if you just order yourself not to, uh, not try not to think, it's like the same common thing that try not to think about pink elephant flying now in oh, the room. Exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. Yeah, so refrain it. Mm -hmm. Also, this is one interesting thing we learned from uh, a Navy SEAL who said that the best uh, training he got as a Navy SEAL on his first day was to make his bed. And, you know, you ask, why? He said, because you learn to do something very small, but perfectly, and you do it first thing in the morning. And if you make that bed and you have it in a perfect, beautiful, you know, finished bed, you walk out of the house and you feel like, 
I've accomplished something already. And then you start applying that to other little things that you do. Finishing a to-do list, writing that extra paragraph, thinking about something maybe a little bit longer that might help you get to a better idea or PowerPoint or whatever. And when you come home at night, what are you met with? That beautifully made bed. And it's not just adults, it's children especially. Um, my daughter, when she read the book, she said, the best thing I learned was about making my bed because she said, after I made my bed, I wanted my books to be straight. I wanted my, my assignment list to be written better. And suddenly everything starts to fall in place. And it sounds so small, but it's actually a very, very important thing. And then basically it comes to organizing your thoughts and action. So you become more sort of clear uh, on, on the more important things than just, you know, making a bed, etc. So it's one yeah. thing or another. Yeah. And one of the problems that people face, George Polio was a famous mathematician. And one of the things he encountered when solving math problems, he said, we try to solve problems that are unsolvable. You have to break a part a problem down into smaller bits and we think this is immensely true in life you're faced with something global warming whatever climate change and we're caught like a deer in the headlights mm -hmm. we're paralyzed what can i do what can i do and then you realize break it down first thing i did is when i use a plastic seal bag i wash them now we don't have any bottled water. We use the tap water. I'm not doing a lot, but it's a little accomplishment. And the same thing when you're doing a job, right? People who we call the dreamers, right? They did, uh, they did a wonderful study at NYU in New York, and they interviewed graduate students, uh, recent graduates. And one group they called the dreamers because they were going to they were going to win the Nobel Prize. They were going to have a billion dollar company. They were going to win an Oscar, whatever it is. And then they had another group and that group they called the plotters. You know, well, tomorrow I'm going to rewrite my resume. I have to buy new paper for my printing machine. Uh, I may look into, maybe I need a new marketing course to take. And so they had little lists that they would do every day. And they followed these groups for years. And what happened? The dreamers went nowhere because they were still in la la land. You know, the way, the way it is when you have a dream, everything's perfect. The plotters, by comparison, were so much more successful. Uh, somebody said it was like climbing Mount Everest with a toothpick. Mm -hmm. it's, it's slow going but I'm going to get to the top. Right. Yeah. Uh, what's his name? Um, James Dyson. He invented the bagless bag. Yes, Dyson. Right. And you think of him as an amazing genius. But when you learn about him, you realized that he worked on this for 15 years. That's it. Woke up every day. How am I going to make a better vacuum cleaner? And he had 5,126 prototypes that didn't work. They just didn't work. And he said, I'm glad they didn't work because every time I had a challenge, I actually made an improvement by going in another direction. And I ended up with something that was just not a small change. I ended up with something that was actually revolutionary because I was willing to make those small steps. And when you make those small steps, you can cross any bridge. And mistakes even, as well, and mistakes. Right. Like, yeah, and so mistakes. Could be, could be mistakes. Yeah. Exactly. Even if you're trying to build a bridge to go over Niagara Falls. In the 1800s, the Canadians and the Americans said, we should build a suspension bridge connecting the U.S. and Canada so people can see the falls and we could both make a lot of money with tourism. The problem was there was no way to build the suspension bridge because there was no way to get the steel cable from New York to, uh, to the other side, to Canada. Mm -hmm. And they, they worked on this for months. They couldn't take a boat because the falls were there. They couldn't fly an airplane because airplanes had not been invented. And at one point they thought they would load up a cannon 
and they would <laughs> from New York and shoot the cable to Canada. But they realized we're friends with Canada. We want to build a bridge. We don't want to bomb them, right? And so what happened? Somebody in the town in, in uh, Buffalo, New York, where they were working on this, said, I don't know anything about building suspension bridge, but why don't we stop thinking about getting a cable across? Why don't we try to get anything across? Like what? I don't know, kids said. Why don't we try to get a kite string across? Why don't we have a kite, a, a kite contest? And who's ever string and kite gets to the other side wins the contest. Well, this little boy named Horace was the first person to get his kite string over to Canada. Mm -hmm. And what did they do? Oh, they, first they gave him $10. $10 at that time was like 1000 right? What did they do? They tied, now they had the US and Canada connected by a string. And to the string, they tethered a thicker string. And to that, a rope. And finally, to that, a cable. And finally, they were able to build the Niagara Bridge, proving that if you want to do something great, maybe it's as easy as telling, buddy, telling someone to just go fly a kite. Yeah, it's absolutely a wonderful story. Yes, and when you mentioned that uh, it's really um, dreaming is one thing, because there are a lot of you know, people who practice uh, law of attraction. And one of the, actually, f not fathers, but one of the, you know, famous person who, who's written a lot about law of attraction, Jack Canfield. Even he said that there is a, in attraction, there is action. There is a ask action word. So you, you cannot just dream. You have to make, you know, to do steps towards your goal, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a must yeah. be work, persistency, tenacity, and all these things which you men mentioned. Absolutely right. You, you know, my old boss, uh, many years ago, um, he, he was an advertising person. I worked for him. I was a creative in advertising. And what I didn't know until years later is that he would come into work every day at nine o'clock, but that before that he would wake up at four 30 every morning and he would write for four hours a day, seven days a week. And he did that for 20 years. He had a desire to become a famous novelist, uh, but he never dreamed about it. He never told anybody about it. He just kept writing and writing and writing. Every single time he wrote a book, it, it, it got every, I'm so sorry. It's okay. Yeah, it, oh, sorry about that. It's okay. Every time he wrote a book or a play, it got rejected. He didn't give up. And when he was 41, he said to me, you know, Linda, I think I figured out how to write a best-selling novel. And he, discussed, and he discussed this idea of Alex Cross and murder mysteries and short chapters. And he showed me the whole thing. We were on a plane at the time going to see a client. And that man, we now know as James Patterson, he is the number one best-selling novelist in the entire world. Um, he's actually doing another novel with Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, uh, a wonderful, wonderful man who I did advertising for, for his 1992 campaign. Um, and he is the, has the same work ethic he's always had. Always had. And he, he doesn't get tethered to technology. He writes longhand. He doesn't like using computers, cell phones, all that distractions. Just, that's it. Well, they say writing is, uh, activates uh, some n neurons in your brain much more than when typing. So it's, it's, uh, there must be some really solid yeah, science behind it's, it. Yeah, it's very interesting because when I'm doing a speech or whatever, um, I write down the words that I need to remember, you know, the dates or whatever. And once I write them down, and it's very unintelligible the way I write, and somebody once said to me, how can you read any of this? I said, I don't need to. Once I've written it down, mm -hmm. I don't have to, I don't look at that paper again. Once I write it, it's actually committed to memory. So you're absolutely right. I was also very curious as to why people are very creative when they are taking a shower, right? Um, and so I read up about this and there was a university in Mexico actually did a study 
And there is a reason for it. When you are taking a shower, the hot water is hitting your head, your skull, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that increases the blood flow in your synapses and brain matter. And so you end up becoming much more creative and thinking a lot more uh, because this hot water is sort of opening up the blood supply a little bit. So I found that very interesting. Well, even Ar 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 Archimed, you know, this Greek philosopher, uh, he was, you know, having a boss. So there must be something. <laughs> and another thing with, with I've read that once you made a decision, it's good to wash your hands. You know, it's like uh, Ponte Pilatus did, you know, when, uh, when making decisions to cru crucify the Christ, he washed his hands. So they say it shows that it's like done. You know, you wash your hands, it's done. There is no way back. You washed your hands. So it's I think that's brilliant. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're doing a lot of hand washing these days. So I guess yeah. we're making a lot of good decisions as we do it. Yeah. yeah that's, that's really terrific. You know, I worked on Dawn uh, liquid detergent i don't know if you have it it's probably called fairy or something where you are but yes, it's yes. made by procter and gamble and um i'm one of these strange people that enjoys washing dishes i guess it is a sense of completion i like seeing this load of dirty dishes and we have a dishwasher but most of the time i just would rather wash them and i never knew what the reason was and you know i said you know i have an insight here is that um it's not just getting this horrible chore done, but there is a sense of satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And so what we add in the advertising, um, we said, what else happens when you finish washing with the dishes? And I said, oh, I put the light out in the kitchen. And that became their little symbol then is, you know, one and done, you know, it's like she turns the light out and she looks at this clean kitchen. And it was very successful. The other thing that we noticed is that successful companies usually are ones that are not just about the um the specific benefit that it gives you right like washing uh dishes in the sink right it's when a company has a larger purpose you know, like we found out with dawn that procter and gamble when there was an oil spill they would donate hundreds and hundreds of bottles of this dawn or fairy it may be called where you are uh, because it is the only liquid soap that is safe and gentle enough for fur and feathers, mm -hmm. but efficacious enough to actually clean the wildlife. And we said to Procter & Gamble, you should let the world know that you're doing this. It's got the same benefit of washing in the sink, right? You, your dishes get clean, but your hands are soft. Let people know. And they let us. There's a little skepticism, and what they found out was sales went up, sales soared. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, people were not just buying a product, they were actually buying into what that product represents. And you see now the success of so many companies around the world who have a larger uh, goal in life. We call it goals of the soul, right? And that, by the way, is the reason that when you look at West Point cadets, you know West Point? In, yes, military. Okay. Yeah. Right? That the ones that are doing it for extrinsic reasons, example, um, I want to make a lot of money, people will pay attention to me. They had a very difficult time completing the four-year course, and most of them dropped out. Mm -hmm. The ones who made it through were the ones who have what we call intrinsic goals, goals that connect to something greater than themselves. For Colin Powell, it was protecting their country. For them, it was um, making the world a safer place. And when you have that in your head, no matter what kind of business you're in, your, your employees will work harder, people will recognize you more, you'll sell more product, because you have a vision that is bigger than yourself. And I think you live longer, because they say once you have this vision, then it motivates you to, first of all, not to pay attention to some, you know, trivial, small things, I mean, small problems, etc. because it's like a lighthouse. It's something which you focus on. And I love this allegory, and I do believe that there is so much truth in that. And finding your mission or life purpose, which is higher than just, you know, money or, you know, some cozy life and Mercedes-Benz, and it's, it makes you feel definitely more appealing to other people. Because people 
uh, I think they are good inside. Most of the people, I mean, they can yes. appreciate the goodness in others. Exactly. We talk about this a lot in one of my other books called The Power of Nice. And what we found was that um, people, uh, human beings, have it in their DNA to help each other. It's how we've survived as a species. And it's the reason why you, when you do something for someone, it lights up the same part of the brain as if somebody gives you a hug or somebody gives you a, a, a lot of money or a gift or something. It actually lights, you know, uh, neuroscientists actually see that part of the brain light up. Right. And so when you are doing something for somebody, uh, and I always tell young people, don't network, don't do networking, do nice working. Figure out ways that you can Excellent. help somebody. Excellent. It will come back in ways that you can't imagine, and I'm proof positive of that. Many of my clients were people who I did favors for, I didn't even remember, but you know they came back. But this idea of putting, putting out these, what I call positive imprints, and they're like seeds, right? Don't think about them. Don't expect the reaction right away, but they're gonna grow and flower in amazing ways. But when you do something nice for somebody, you feel better about yourself, and when you feel better, you work harder, right? Mm -hmm. It's easier for you to just stay on track. Uh, there's a, a famous a gentleman whose name I can't recall right now, who answers like all his emails and he, he teaches in college and he sees all his students and people say, why are you, well, you're so productive, you've written so many books. He said, because I answer everybody's emails and I take the time to help people. And that has created a force in me to work harder than ever. Wonderful. I mean, really, really good. Look, we were talking already for an hour. <laughs> really? Yes. You are such an easy person to talk to. And it's really, it's really a pleasure. I feel like um, I found a friend, really. I mean, I feel uh, very, very close to you and, and your values and your way you describe yeah. it very close to my heart. And uh, we, we haven't actually touched many um, areas which are a part of the book. But what, we, right. what we've done... I think is enough, you know, things to, to really to, to, to think and, and implement. I mean, because everybody now knows everything. Internet gives you power of knowledge, but it doesn't give you the power of action. In fact, it deprives you. Exactly. Of it. Yeah, exactly. So, Can I finish with just one story? Uh, when we wrote the book, uh, I yeah. do a lot of work for an organization. Well, I, I, I don't want to, to stop it. I really enjoying it. So, I mean, oh, oh. just concerned about your time. I would love to talk maybe a little bit longer if possible. Yeah, well, I'll just end with this one story, which I end with a lot of my speeches, is um, I work with a group called Covenant House. Covenant House is all over the world, but mostly in the U.S. And what they do is they provide shelter and training and food and a place to live for people, uh, adults who are 18 to 23, right? And, uh, and that's their mission. Uh, as a matter of fact, when you start doing stuff for them, you have to actually sleep outside for one night so you can experience what homeless kids feel like, right? By the way, the worst, the worst thing in the world, sleeping out at night. It's horrible. Anyway, but you, you understand so much more. Anyway, I was interviewing somebody in the New York office, one of the uh, caseworkers there. And I said, tell me a time when you, your grit really worked. And he said, um, about 20 years ago, I was about 19 years old, 20 years old, and I started working at Covenant House in Los Angeles. And we would help bring kids off the street, and we try to get them off of drugs and prostitution, and we try to give them uh, learning you know, courses and teach them how to get a job and, you know, and basically have a shelter for them for several years. Um, and it worked very well, except for this one guy. Um, this guy, Ray. And Ray would, they would pick up off the streets and within 30 days, he was back to the street, prostituting himself, stealing money, taking drugs, you name it. And they kept collecting him and he kept going back. And finally they decided they were going to give up on Ray. But Brian, Bob, the gentleman that I knew, he, who ident he said, you know, I have had a challenge like two about the same age. I'm not going to give up on him. So he had an idea. He said, Ray, come with me. We're not going to go to Covenant House. We're not? No. I'm going to take you to a permanent home. 
And he was so excited. Wow, a permanent home where I can stay and it's going to be great and I'll be taken care of. But you know where he took him? He took him to the slums and the fire pits in Los Angeles where there were drunks and rats and, and thieves. And he left him there and he said, bye, Ray. And Ray got so upset. But you told me you were going to take me to my permanent home. He said, well, you don't listen to anything we tell you at Covenant House. So let's just start here. You're going to be living here for the rest of your life. Take care. And Ray pleaded with him and pleaded with him and crying. Give me one more chance. Please give me one more chance. All right, you got one more chance and that's it. Took Ray back to Covenant House in New York. But soon after, Brian was relocated um, to the New York office, right? And Ray, sorry, and Ray was in, you know, in, in, in LA. So Brian gets relocated to the New York office. 10 years go by. He gets a phone call from the gentleman who was the head of Covenant House in Los Angeles. He says, Brian, do you know a guy named Ray? He just walked in here. Brian starts to think about it and he starts to cry. He says, oh my God, he must be about 30 years old now. Is he okay? And the head worker said, oh yeah, he's okay. He came in with a three-piece suit, nice hair, shaven. He showed me a picture of his wife and his three kids. He said, I have something else for you. He didn't just walk in alone. He walked in with a check for $10,000. And he said, if you see Brian, you tell him that the day he took me to those slums was the last day I ever took drugs and the first day of the rest of my life. So never believe for one minute, for one second, that each of us does not have the ability, the stamina, the grit, the tenacity to change one life, hundreds of lives, thousands of lives. Anybody can do it, and all it takes is grit. Wonderful story, wonderful story. So hard medicine very often works much better than uh, just praising self-esteem and, and uh, you know, all this stuff. So, whew, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you. The book has been translated into Russian. Uh, unfortunately, they found the title, which I think is a little bit silly. It's called Zhvetnaya Khvatka. It's like iron, iron grip. So I thought it's really not kind of a good reflection on the spirit of the book. Right, yeah. Um, but Power of Nice as is, uh, or Power of Small has been translated as well. But I will make an effort and I will contact the publisher and I suggest that they should translate all other books which you've written. Thank and, you. The, the one that's actually the bestseller that's all over the world, I'm surprised it's not where you are, is The Power of Nice. Power of Nice, yeah. How yeah, that's been translated. With kindness or something. Which yes, I, exactly, exactly. I think. And you know, I am... Uh, doing lots of virtual talks right now if you're interested and and once you know we get back on square one mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always open i love traveling to do events if you hear of anything so yes i would love to i would love to organize something uh and maybe online or something we'll, we'll definitely will will we'll think of something right so, uh, so, uh, so mm -hmm. i can just i can tell you um i don't know if you can read this but mm -hmm. This is all my, can you see that? Uh, no, it's too hard. With, right. Uh, right. I mean, you're, you're, but it's okay if you can drop me maybe a, a, an email or, you know. Sure. I will send I'll just you. do that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, but because now they, there are, I don't know whether things will go back to normal. And I hope they won't. Because I do believe that normal will be better normal. That more meaningful with the more values you know, right. than just before all this, uh, you know, hustle of chasing up some you know, unimportant things and getting you know upset by some silly things. Right. But um, I think it was uh, Joe Vitale 
a friend of mine from The Secret, he said it's divine conspiracy. He said universe, universe has created that for us to stop and think. Maybe I, something. You know, by the way, I mean, pollution went down, obviously. And I think, um, I do believe in God, you know, I'm Jewish. I, th I think you are as well. Yeah. But I believe God in, in, I guess more in the Jewish religion, it's not a person, but it's sort of like in us, whatever, is that uh, nature is telling us something. It's telling us that our priorities are really screwed up because this pandemic is horrific, but the real, real issue is global warming and it is coming fast and furious. I just read a book called The Uninhabitable Earth, um, which you I think- You wrote a book. You wrote a book. No, no, I didn't write it. No, it's mm. called The Uninhabitable Earth. Mm. And it's a very painful book. It's written by different scientists. Very, very painful book to read. You can only read a couple of chapters at a time. But I mean, my, my, our son is, uh, has his degree is PhD in behavioral economics. Mm -hmm. And they talk a lot in the book about behavioral economics is that they want people to understand what's going on and take action, but they will paralyze them with fear when you read about what's really going on. What you read about in the newspapers and the TV is not even close to what's going on. And so they're trying to find ways to have people take action without making them like, well, I, I can't do anything. But it is, it is coming much faster than anybody thought. They say the water that was gonna be maybe one or two inches, maybe six inches now. I mean, it's, it's all happening and it's like, it's happening exponentially, right? It's just worse, I mean, 10 times worse. And so, um, I don't know, you know, you have small children and yeah, I look I, at my kids, it's scary. Yeah, and I do believe that, you know, like you said, we should start doing something on our plot of land. I mean, we cannot, magnitude of the problem must not scare us. We should start doing small things but you know, systematically, jointly, and and uh, and putting a pressure on those, and and I think the whole business model should be changed somehow. I mean, all this um, because all this global warming is because of uh, desire for profit. I mean, with the, you know, I'm kind of I do believe in free entrepreneurship, etc. But when big corporations, for whatever reason, you know, they sometimes hide the truth and do all these things, uh, you know, it's terrible. Uh, and it's terrible. And it's, I think if we change the business model that, let's say, planting a tree and will get us profit in whatever way. I mean, I'm kind of fantasizing here a little bit, but doing something really for, for the planet, something good. Then for that, we should be gratified materially or, you know, get right. some benefits, not just by destroying, you know, and I know terrible things, uh, you know, in Latin America, all this, um, you know, rainforests are being burned and for the sake of, okay, Brazil wants to become industrial nation, but um, it, the road to nowhere, it's a terrible thing. And it's happening all over, happening all over. And it's, it's make me sad. And of course, I think about children, you know, I, I am all right. I mean, I, I don't know how yeah. long I'll have to leave, but, but for my children, of course, and it's, it's, it's terrible. For me. You know, I, I often think there was a stupid, uh, series on television a few years ago. I only watched it because the guy who played the scientist was very cute. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it was good so looking. And cause my, I mean, it was so bad, right? And the, the, the premise is there's a, there's a meteor coming towards Earth and we have 180 days to find a way to push it off someplace or get rid of it or whatever. And um, my husband always asked me, well, what did, what did you learn? I said, I wasn't, I don't really, <laughs> I don't know what the plot is. I, I never had this before in my whole life. Never in my whole life. I said, he is so cute. And I, I, he had, he spoke, he, he's very like, he's sort of part British, part Persian, part this sort of, and he speaks like in real life, he speaks like five languages. And, I mean, just amazing. And I said to Fred, he's so good looking. I actually don't listen to anything he's saying. And I'm probably the only person that watched the show. I don't know anybody that watched the show. <laughs> but one thing I did learn on this series is that when the meteor is coming to Earth, suddenly everybody's friends on Earth. Every country comes together. And 
because it was visually, you could visually like look at a telescope and see this thing coming at you. And I, I said to Fred, you know, it's like this virus, I thought this was going to really connect yeah, right. us right. and it's divided us. And, you know, our president has not helped in the least, of course. Um, and the same thing with global warming. It's like if we could visually see something hurling towards Earth, mm -hmm. then I think we would take the right action. But it is just impossible for me to believe that we do not have leaders around the world that see this and say, we got to work on this together, you know? Apart from this small Swedish girl, you know, who, <laughs> who made more impact, I think. You know, than anybody yeah. i know and she's aut and she's autistic there you go is she well anyway it was wonderful <laughs> meeting you